my lecture today. Before I get started, uh, I want to say I've already uploaded uh, midterm one practice questions, so you can check uh, the module uh, for that. Okay, go ahead. Yeah, the study material like midterm. Oh, you mean apart from the midterm one? That whether study material, right? Yeah, yeah. I think I said um, the midterm one will be based on week what we did in week one and week two only. Like what we're doing week is not going to be part of midterm one. So the the best material for midterm one would be assignment one and two. But I know that assignment two is currently ongoing, so most of the questions. We have to do, we test your basic knowledge of what we've done. So, okay, so I, I want to welcome you to this topic. Uh, I remember yesterday we started uh, module diagnostics. The essence of module diagnostics is, um, a method of module diagnostics is just to evaluate our module. Okay, uh, how valid is our module? So, we need to subject uh, our module to diagnostic testing before um, it can be used. So we want to continue from that today. So I call this uh, module diagnostic uh, part two, okay, which is uh, actually more than just a science. Now I'm going to walk you through some scenarios. Okay, now I need you to uh, pay attention uh, to this. I'm actually using the material, uh, my material that I uh, in another section. Now, I, I wanted to pay attention to this three uh, graph. Okay, let's take a look at the first one. Okay, uh, the first one here. Uh, give me one second. Am I able to write? Oh. Okay, now um, when you take a look at this guy, okay, that's a linear, right? That's a linear model, right? Okay, that is a picture, okay? Now, when you take a look at the model, okay, and we consider RSS of the model, the RSS, it means residual sum of square. Because at times, if I really want to know how valid it's my model, okay? I look at the residual sum of square. Now, the P plus one here that you see uh, having two here means I got two numbers of parameters. The numbers of parameters I mean beta naught and the beta one. Okay, when I move to the this one, take a look at this guy. That is just a constant mode, right? There's no slope, right? That is why you see an horizontal. Can you see an horizontal line? Okay. And the RSS that we go for that is bigger. Okay. You know, what, what is that telling you between this and this? Is that between that and that, uh, uh, you know, the a constant module is not fine at all because look at the RSS. The residual sum of square is very is large compared to the that of the linear one. Now, when we continue, and we decided to use a polynomial this time around to the same data, polynomial of degree four. Do you see the do you see polynomial of degree four? Okay, maybe we've been, you know, we started with. The first one here, this what this guy is polynomial of degree zero is a constant, right? Polynomial of degree one is linear. Polynomial of degree two is quadratic. Polynomial of degree three is cubic. Polynomial of deg so take a look at the RSS here. What is the RSS equal to zero? Okay. Are, are we supposed to be celebrating? We're supposed to be celebrating but we are not going to celebrate because situation we are um, residual sum of square equal to zero. That implies a perfect model. We don't want a perfect model. 
Does that make sense? We don't because the reason we, you can never get a a model that gives exact uh, characterization of reality in a stochastic world is not going to be possible. So in that situation, that is over fitness, over fitness. We're not, we're not, we don't want that. So what we normally, even though we want to improve on the RSS, we want to improve on the residual sum of squared, but we're also going to make sure that our module don't suffer what we call over parameterization. You know, in that very module right now, there's a lot of parameters in it. If you take a look at that, and that is actually giving us uh, what we have right now, the RSS equal to zero, okay? We're not interested in that. Now, what we're interested in is to get a moderate one. Now, if you take a look at what I have here, and that was why I said, relatively, this guy is going to be a good fit. Okay? That's a relatively good fit. Relate, because in statistics, in research generally, we actually want a simple model as, you know, as much as possible. We want a simpler model. Because uh, having a complicated model, okay, uh, it's not going to be friendly at times. Now, I needed to take a look at that. Now, uh, you remember yesterday, I talked about some abnormalities in data point. You remember you saw HII, right? Okay, the HII, if I want to talk about HII, actually is a measure of a leverage. You know, when, when, when there's an extreme value in X, okay, we could be suspecting I leverage. But I leverage, we have a rule for high leverage points because some points may look like they may be on the straight line just like what I showed you yesterday, but far away from other, right? And you are suspecting them to be high leverage point. Okay? They may not necessarily be looking at your the, the visual I mean, by visual means. And that is the reason why we're always going to have a threshold. Now, this, this is a threshold. If I compute my HII across data point, if you take a look at this, what are we focusing on? Look at this guy. Variable X, right? Don't forget, I said extreme value in S can be suspected to be high leverage, right? Extreme values in X. Why extreme values in Y could be suspected to be outlier. But right now, HII, you're going to compute it for all the observation. And if HII is greater than 4 over N, what is N? N is the number of observation. And if you do 4 over N, so if your HII is greater than that, then we're going to refer to that particular data point in S as a high leverage point. So we got it. We got a threshold. That's a threshold right now. Is there any question before I move to measuring our clients? Oh, oh, do you mean do you mean this guy? Oh, the numerator. Yeah, the numerator is just you find the mean of x, you are now subtracting the mean of x from each individual x. No, it's not a variable, but it's just the square of the difference between the uh, x and the mean. Yeah, it's just individual. Uh, uh, I'm not going to say variance for individual. Uh, but, uh, it's just going to be like what make individual to uh, the deviation from the average for individual. But I'm not going to call because variance is a mean. Do you know variance is an average? Average of what? Variance is going to be at the average of this guy. But this one is just for individual. How indiv oh, okay, let me put it this way. How individual deviated away from the average? Exactly, because it's a single point. And because of the single point, you're going to have so many of these, depending on the number of the X. Does that make sense? And we're now trying to say, because we really want to identify uh, values in the S 
that is likely going to be a high leverage point, and we're actually using that threshold. Okay, that's a good question. Now, I'm gonna go into measuring outliers. Of course, we did that yesterday. We got traditional way of measuring outlier. We look at the air, uh, residual and the standardized residual, but I wanted to pay attention. Inside the standardized residual, what do you see? HII. And where is HII? Do you see HII, the formula there? Please pay attention, okay? You can see that, right? And so the traditional way is using residual and standardized cell. Uh, residual and let me tell you this, if I'm using residual to identify potential outliers, if I'm using that, I'm actually going to focus on, I will look for observation with the extreme residual. That is what I'm using residual. But if I'm using standardized residual, okay, then the, the one I can tolerate where I can say there's no outlier, it should be it should be between negative two and two. Look for the observation with the standardized residual outside negative two and two. When it is outside negative two and two, okay, by standardized residual, we actually going to refer to, uh, you know, this arrow i we we correspond to a particular values of y, right? That that data point is actually going to be uh, regarded as an outlier. Whatever we do, we actually have a threshold. But you know what? The residual way and the standardized residual way have, have been debated, debated by statisticians. And, you know, they still believe, some still believe um, these two conventional ways of uh, identify outliers may not um, at times uh, give, uh, because if you take a look at that, somebody is using negative two to two, and that person can decide to say, okay, I'm going to use negative three to three. And that person can decide to say, I'm going to use negative four to four. You know why? Because outlier in my feed may not be outlier in your feed. Does that make sense? So you got to put into consideration. So because of the fact that, you know, there have been kind of uh, arguments about that, and that was why Cook now came in, okay, and said, okay, what is important? Is not, Cook now, Cook realized that it is not about just identifying them, but how influential they are, okay? And when you take a look at the Cook formula here, when you take a look at the Cook formula here, you're actually going to see that Cook actually use ROI in the standardized residual and HII in the other one. So when you take a look at what I have, it's like Cook has already, you know, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, consider all of that. You know, in the formula of the Cook distance, he has put into consideration. It's like he modify. Um, the conventional way of uh, detecting uh, outlier. And Cook now has a threshold. That is that. Look for the observation with a Cook distance greater than one. Does that make sense? Okay. Now that is uh, that, that. Okay. Now, uh, this is just to remind you of the linear regression assumption that we've done before, the variance of error is sigma square constant uh, of variance. And the variance of error is different from the variance of the residual. I need, I, please pay attention to these two, okay? The variance of error is not the same as the variance of residual. The variance of error is sigma squared. That's an assumption, constant variance. The variance of residual is sigma squared one minus HII. Then what is the condition under which the variance of error and the variance of residual will be the same when HII equal to zero? And that may not be possible. Okay? That may not be possible. So the implication now, the observations have S closer to the average when observation 
are S closer to the average. We have what leverage? Can somebody tell me? I need you to go. I need you to come back here. Which observation are we talking about? I'm going to, uh, you need to come back here. Okay. Uh, okay, here. Uh, let me clean up so that you're going to see what I mean. Okay. Now take a look at, uh, okay, so take a look at this. Uh, give me one second. Yeah, this. If, 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 if an observation is very close to the mean, what will happen to HII? Eh? Is it large, like if it is close? Is, it, is this guy going to be large or small? Yeah, exactly, it's going to be small. Good job. And when this guy is small, okay, you know, when that guy, when this is close, that guy is likely going to be zero. And, and if you have a last sample size, this is this guy is actually gonna tend to zero. And with that guy, when HII tend to zero, okay, that's a perfect that's a perfect one. When HII tend to zero, what is gonna happen? The variance of the error and the variance of the residual, they're gonna be the same. Yeah, because when HII equal to zero, what is happening? That would be sigma squared, that one's also gonna be sigma squared. Yeah. In the statistics is very, very so that is a question we are now asking here. Okay, we said the implication now. I said the observations of x closer to the average. We have dash leverage. What leverage now? Is it larger leverage or smaller leverage? Exactly. Now the residual of the observation. What will now happen to the the residual of the observation with a smaller leverage? We have dash variance the residual of the observation with a smaller leverage. Don't forget, when the, the when this guy is small, when this guy is small, then this is going to be very close to that guy. Does that make sense? So that is just the implication. Okay, now, here we said the residuals of the observation with smaller leverage, we have dash, okay, are they going to have a larger variance or smaller variance? Now, when you take a look at uh, at this here, so when you take a look at this guy, right, depending on the value of HII, okay, when HII AA is a fraction, when HII equal to zero, they're going to be the same. But HII can be whatever value. That now depends. Okay, now, we are still on diagnostic testing. You remember yesterday, uh, uh, I said we use residual plots. I mean, residual plot is one of our diagnostic uh, plots. We use residual plots to investigate linearity and what? And cost and variance. But you know, yesterday we've not talked about normality. How do we investigate normality assumption? So investigating normality assumption, we use a QQ plot. Okay, this is the, at a time we call it normal QQ plot. Take a look at this. This is how normal QQ plot actually, uh, uh, you know, uh, this is the way, uh, actually the way it looks. This is a normal QQ plot. Now, if if data sets are normally distributed, we expect to have something like a diagonal straight line. Okay? So I just wanted to take notes of that. Now, the, this is a QQ plot that we draw for the rate my professor that I said I would do the other time, where we are relating quality to clarity. Okay? And of course, my TA walk you through how to generate a QQ plot very easy. Okay, the diagnostic plot. Now, away from that, I want us to pay attention right now. I actually uh, want to say this. I need you to listen. I want to say, I'm going to say this. Okay, uh, diagnostic uh, plot could be misleading. Just a way, you know, the same way that 
a particular court who mislead by taking wrong decision. We've seen uh, judgment uh, delivered by a court in the past that was declared non and void in an, in an upper court. So what I want to walk you through now, what are the situations under which we may not be able to trust our diagnostic uh, plots? Don't forget, these diagnostic plots, they are serving like, a, like judges, right? They'll be able to judge whether we, have a, we got a good model or not by we use them to investigate whether assumptions hold but they could be misleading and i'm going to identify that okay now please i need you to pay attention if we really want to know you know what we're going to do we can generate model ourselves maybe we know the right thing and we want our diagnostic plot to detect that at times, you know what we do in science? What we do in science is maybe I know what I eat. I know what I ate yesterday. And maybe I don't know what I'm going to eat today. And I come to somebody, okay? If, if I really want to trust you, I'm going to say, okay, tell me what I ate yesterday. Before you can tell me, before you can predict what I'm going to eat today, Okay, even though I don't know what I'm going to eat today, but I know what I ate yesterday. Then you need to tell me what I ate yesterday. So what we normally do here is uh, to be able to pretend. Okay, now take a look at this. We gener well, that are generated from this. We have a way in statistics to generate data set. Okay, uh, data for Y and data for X. Okay. And assuming that the errors follow normal distribution with the mean zero and the variance sigma squared. So we do simulation, okay, where we artificially fabricate data. Does that make sense? Have you guys, have you heard about simulation before when you simulate data? Okay. Now, I want to, I want to present a, a first scenario. Case, case scenario A to you, okay? Now, can you see sigma squared? You know one of the assumptions of the linear regression is that error follow, uh, error as a constant variance, right? What is the square root of the variance? Sig standard deviation, right? Now, when I'm simulating from that, and I actually tell my computer, I want sigma to be two, and I want my sample size to be large, 500, can you see that? Okay. And when I was generating this data set, I generated from normal. Okay. If I generate normal, okay, if you take a look at what I have now. Now I said, and, I, and, 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 and when, I, when I was checking that, the, the fact that the expected value of error equal to zero, expected value of error equal to zero means linear relationship you know i told you right when the expected value of error equal to zero linear relationship which means my when i was generating my data set okay i i have already i know the relationship to be linear or you know that is a normal that's a relationship i know the distribution to be normal okay but i want my uh diagnostic plot to, to, to actually uh, tell me, I want, I, I, it's like I'm setting the, my diagnostic uh, plot on trial to be able to see whether it's going to actually uh, tell me correcting. Now, look at what I said here. The diagnostic plot are more trustworthy. Please pay attention. The diagnostic plot are most trustworthy when sample size is large. How do I know that? Because when I simulate, when sample size is small, the diagnosis, uh, you know, is actually going to be telling me wrong thing. It's only telling me the right thing when the sample size is large. Now, uh, take a look at this. This is the data. This is the scatter plot of the data that I generated. What is the scatter plot telling me? Straight line, right? That's super cool. Okay. 
Now, if the dollar, if if it's selling me straight line, that's super cool. I'm expecting the residual to to not uh, to not to have a pattern, right? Let's let's look at the residual for the same data. Okay, can you see the residual for the same data? You know, I told you the other time that before you can actually uh, conclude that assumptions of linearity uh, are met, you look at the scalar plot, you look at the residual plot. The scalar plot must give you uh, a straight line. The residual plot should be without pattern. Does that make sense? Okay, now, what about the normality? Take a look at this. Did you see that I told you the other time? When the normal QQ plot shows the diagonal straight line, you see that? That shows it is normal. Does that make sense? That shows uh, the, now here, the, the diagnostic plot actually did a great job. But you know what? When you try, it only did a great job because of the fact that I choose a large sample size of 500. Do you see that? When I choose a very small sample size, even though uh, I'm actually simulating uh, from normal and, um, and uh, uh, such that the expected value of error equal to zero, it may be telling me a different thing. Okay, now that is case, that is scenario number, uh, uh, scenario A. Okay, now I want us to go to scenario B. Now you're going to see something now. You know what I've done here? I decided, I decided to change my sample size to 50 from 500. Okay, this is looking small compared to the other one, but every other thing stay the same, okay? And not only that, okay? You know, some, you may not, what is the essence of the sigma? When sigma is small, okay, that will indicate a strong relationship. When sigma is large, that indicates a weak relationship. Now, I, I look at this. I said, diagnostic plot may be misleading, especially when the sample size is small. How do I know? Now, we choose a sample size of 50. The data set we use, we actually simulated them, uh, putting into consideration the normality of the error, okay? Now, uh, if you take a look at it, I said, the residual plot shows potential violation. Let's see. Let's see whether it shows a potential violation. Oh my God, take a look at the residual plot. That is showing a potential violation, even though when I was simulating my data, I actually put into consideration cost and variance. Go ahead. Oh, the theoretical... No, the theoretical quantile is just the standardized residual that was plotted. You can see here, this is the standardized residual. Yeah, that was what, what was plotted. You remember the other time we talked about standardized residual, right? When we're detecting an uh, outlier. So that was what was plotted against theoretical quantiles. But uh, what we do, since you're going to be using um, Arrow software, the moment you write your module, we're just going to say plot more M, uh, your module uh if you if you write if you if you write plot module it's going to display all the necessary diagnostic plot for you okay now you can see here it's actually giving a violation okay of the cost and variance that was why you said the residual plus shows potential violation of equal variance the QQ plus also shows violations of normality okay now take a look at this. You got, do you see the QQ plot? Does that look like a diagonal straight line? No. Look at the QQ plot. Okay. Yeah. Uh, uh, this is a QQ plot. You know, compare this guy. You can see some some point here. Look at that. The video. You see that. But compare that to this guy. I'm going to show you. Compare it to. Compare that with that. One. Do you see? Do you see that guy? You see that. 
these are more or less clustered on that. But look at the other one. Look at the the uh, the other one. Do you see? Do you see this one here? Now, what has happened? Do you know that what has happened here? That's by the fact that when we were simulating our data, we put into consideration the assumption, but the diagnostic test is telling us here there's a violation of a constant variance and a violation of normality. You know, the only thing that is not violated is a, uh, when you look at the scatter plot, like the straight line. And that is not true. And the reason why that happened is because of the fact that we're working with a small sample. Does that make sense? Okay, but there are no violations according to how we define the error. Because when we were simulating our data, we ensure that error actually follow normal distribution. You know, with, you know when error follow normal distribution, we expect that our Kiki plot should give us a sense of normality. Does that make sense? Okay, so that is the reason. Now, this is for linear model. That is for case B. Now, I want to go to... Now, I'm still on linear model. I'm still on linear model. But this time around, maybe somebody may want to argue this out, that maybe that only... Maybe the uh, inconsistency of a diagnostic plot maybe only applicable to strong relationship. We can say, okay, let us, let us also try the weak relationship. Well, how, how do I know it's a weak one? Look at the sigma. The standard deviation is so large. You know, the, other, the one we considered before, the standard deviation was four. The more the standard deviation, the more the weak, the more the relationship become weaker. When the standard deviation is very small, the relationship is going to be strong. Now, what we want to do now, I'm back at what? At 500, I want to investigate that for both. Uh, I want to investigate sample, large sample size and small sample size for weaker relationship. Does that make sense? Is there any question here? Okay. Now, the weak linear relationship. I want, please, I want you to take note of this. The weak linear relationship doesn't equate to violation of assumption. The fact that your relationship between two variables is weak does not mean assumption is violated because you know why? Relationship could exist, could be weak or strong. Does that make sense? Okay, that's what we mean. Now, I, I, I need you to look at the scalar plot. Okay, look at the scalar plot and look at the residual plot. Look at the normal uh, QQ plot, then I have, so what do you see? What what can you say about, is there any violation? Take a look at that. You know, don't forget, uh, we, if it, we, uh, uh, so no assumption is violated. You take a look at all of that. So what, what am I, what am I trying to say here? The fact that a weak, relationship exists does not translate into violations. A relationship, when you establish a linear relationship, it could be a weak one, it could be a strong one. Does that make sense? And that is what I demonstrated to you right now. Okay, do you know what I want to do? I now want to move away from linear relationship. I want to go into non-linear. What am I having now? Can you see this guy? I'm having a non-linear relationship because you can see 10 sign. That's a non-linear relationship. I also want to invest, I also want to look at the behavior of diagnostic testing, you know, of diagnostic tools or plots when it comes to non-linear relationship. And the, you know, whether linear or non-linear relationship, we also have errors in the model. Can you see error? Okay, whether you are talking about linear or non-linear, we expect the behavior of the error, uh, you know, to be okay, you know. And, uh, you know, when we're simulating this model, error follow normal distribution. Can you see here, right? Error follow normal distribution with a constant variance. 
Okay, now in case scenario D, we're considering nonlinear relationship, like I said, and we're considering small sample. Okay, I needed to take note of that. But I, I, asked, I, I put something in red. Diagnostic plot may not capture violations when you're talking about nonlinear. Does that make sense? You know, if you try that, oh, I, I'm, you know, I actually build a nonlinear model, and I, I actually want to see how I can trust my model, and I want to use a diagnostic uh, plot, okay, uh, for small sample now, okay, and that was why. Look at it. I said the residual plot and scatter plot may fool the statistician to believe that linear assumption is met. Now take a look at this. When we, when we're simulating our data. What is the relationship that we simulate a nonlinear? And let us see what the diagnostic test is going to tell us. Oh my God. Do you see what the diagnostic uh, uh, tool is actually telling us now? It's giving an indication of linear. And even though when we simulated our data, okay, well, when we simulated our data, we know it's not linear. And that was why you see here, okay. Uh, the, the residual plot and the scatter plot may fool the statistician to believe that linearity assumption is meant why it is actually violated. We know from the beginning because we know how we simulate our data. Look at the picture now. Imagine a statistician or a researcher that actually use a diagnostic tools for nonlinear relationship to justify the validity of the model, okay, I'm actually going to refer to that as an exercise in futility. Okay, so let's look at that. Now, still on the nonlinear, you know the other time we talk about small sample, right? Let's see if maybe the situation may change when it comes to large sample. Okay? You know, we we still we still we still fitting non-linear, right? Can you see that? It's still fitting non-linear relationship. Okay. Now I said violation of one assumption may affect the diagnostic of another assumption. You know, at times when sample size is large, okay, these diagnostic tools, irrespective of the model, they actually gonna behave well. Does that make sense? But let me tell you this. If one assumption is violated, okay, it should have other assumptions too. Now, let's look at uh, the, let's start with the scatter plots. What happened here? What is it telling us? That's a violation. That's it's not a straight line. Okay. So, you know, so due to the violation of linearity, okay, we don't even need to test normality. Okay, so due to the violation of linearity, QQ plot is not a trustworthy tool for evaluating normality assumption anymore. Okay, and if you take a look at what I have here, oh my God, that is looking approximately normal, but that cannot be trusted because of the fact that linearity assumption is violated. And I, I know the reason why that guy is behaving like that because the sample size is large. Does that make sense? Okay. Now, that is that scenario. You know what, where I want to go now? The last scenario, what I want to do in the last scenario, I, I don't want my error to come from normal anymore. Let me tell you this. The, the probability distribution of the error could be normal or not. Okay, now I need you to I need you to take a look at this, right? That is which is uh, looking. If you take a look at that model right now, okay, I when I'm simulating the model, uh, I I I I allow the error to follow a different distribution, okay, which is gamma. A, a gamma distribution is a uh, uh, you know, another probability distribution that is not normal. You know, that have a parameter one and five because we got two parameters in a gamma distribution. Okay, for sample size of 500, okay, 
you know, from the beginning, what happened from the beginning when I simulated my data, there's been violation of normality, right? I know. Because I simulated, when I'm simulating my data, the error follow gamma distribution. Do you know what I want to do now? I want my, I want the diagnostic uh, truth to dictate that, no, that non-normality. Okay? Now, when the, when the, when the, when the sample size is large, 500, let us see the, what, let us see the QQ plot. Okay? Do you see that? The QQ plot shows violation. It's behaving well. But you know what? When you try small sample, the QQ plot is going to tell you that this is normal. And even though, what happened? Even though, look at what I said. The QQ plot indicates violations of normality absorption. Indeed, we have defined error to follow gamma, but is the QQ plot is telling us that because the sample size is large. When you try for smaller sample size, don't be surprised. Okay, the QQ plot is going to say it's normal. Even though when you were simulating your data, the error does not follow normal. Okay, so which means now, because of that, I actually put a note, a corpus of notes on a corpus of notes on diagnose on, on using diagnostical plots. You know, why do we need to be guided? Why do we need this information? Because we don't want a situation whereby we commit a lot of resources to research only to be let down by poor statistical tools. We need to be guided. Okay, now a couple notes on using diagnostic plot. Number one, diagnostic plots are more trustworthy when the sample size is large. They are only trustworthy when the sample size is large. Okay, two, Diagnostic plot may be misleading, especially when the sample size is small or when the data do not cover the entire range of X. Okay, now you're working with something now and the data you have does not cover the entire range of X because in real life, we're always going to have the minimum value a data point can be and the maximum. Maybe in your own research, you, uh, it doesn't cover the entire range. Three, weak linear relationship does not equate to violation. Okay? So a relationship can be weak. That's no problem. Okay? And diagnostic plot may not capture violations. I think I've demonstrated that today. Violation of one assumption may affect the diagnostic of another assumption. Okay? You know, you know, even, even in the in hospital, uh, when somebody complain about headache, it could lead to something else. Okay? When somebody have a particular um, disease, if it is not properly checked, it's, it may lead to some other. So, and that is that. Now, what is the principle? Principle now that we need to, okay? The principle is this. We're going to treat all model as the way we treat a suspect in the court of law. A suspect is assumed to be innocent until it is proven guilty. Okay? Now, that was why I said that. Innocent until the overwhelming evidence proof guilt. Believe that no assumptions have been violated, okay, unless there's a strong evidence in the diagnostic plot. And let me also tell you this. Apart from using a diagnostic uh, plot, because of the inconsistency of diagnostic uh, plots, we also have other means, other ways of testing module validity. Does that make sense? We can't rely on diagnostic plot only because of the fact that the um, the capacity or the uh, or uh, the ability of a diagnostic uh, plot actually rely on the nature of the sample size. Does that make sense? And that is the reason why you need to check whatever diagnostic plot you are using, check your sample size. It matters a lot. Okay? And 
as time goes on, I'm actually going to show you some other ways uh, we can, uh, the alternative ways, uh, you know, that we can use to check uh, these assumptions, you know, apart from, uh, you know, using a uh, diagnostic uh, plot. But the diagnostic plot is only just going to give us an idea of what is going on. You know, it's just like when, 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 when somebody is sick and the person visits a clinic. I, I know before the, uh, the physician, we run a laboratory test. A physician, we look, we examine physically uh, the patient, right? You know, at times they could touch the hand. They, then they, 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 with their experience, they will recommend tests, right? And at times, the physician may even conduct more, you know, tests more than once. You understand? Because it, when, when, when they do it once, you know, it, 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 don't forget that um, our equipment that we use in the testing cannot also be relied upon 100%. Does that make sense? There's something that we call uh, sensitivity and specificity. Have you heard about that? Okay. Somebody may have a disease and the equipment may not detect that. Of course, we have false positive, false negative uh, around. Okay, this is going to be the end of the uh, lecture today. Uh, we're done with uh, diagnostic. Uh, is there any question, uh, question or that, whether in person or online? Is there any question before we go today? Oh, okay, no, okay. Is there anybody want to ask question? Need any clarification? Okay, like I said, uh, I'm going to post the meet time on Friday. Uh, and the, I'm going to leave the meet time open for 48 hours. So, which means you have until 11.59 p.m. on Sunday. Okay? Now, but it is being programmed. If you, if you are not ready to start, don't start. Because the moment you click on start, your time is going to be running out. Does that make sense? Oh, go ahead. Oh, okay, that's a good question. No policy. Um, you have access. You have access to whatever that will make you comfortable. It's an open exam. Does that make sense? It's gonna. It's an open exam. You. You are not. You know. You can be anywhere to take this exam. That's what I'm saying. You can take it in the night. I. I don't need to be there when you are taking it. Okay, but. You're actually going to join the Zoom whenever you want to take it. And your video horn. I want to see the person writing the exam. You got to make sure when you join the, the Zoom, is always going to be on. Does that make sense? So when you join the Zoom, you to, uh, put on your video. I want to see you. Use whatever resources that will make you succeed in the exam. And immediately you submit you're actually going to receive your grade for multiple choice, but you're not going to see your grade for a uh, short answer because I've seen it go grade the short answer. But when you receive your grade for multiple choice, don't be panic. That is just based on the multiple choice. That has happened before, okay? Okay, is there any other question before? Go ahead. Yeah, I can confirm to you there's going to be coding. Yeah. There is going to be coding. So, oh, how long you're going to have the exam? Uh, I think it depends on whether somebody have accommodation or not. You know, we have some DRC students. So, what is going to? I'm going to put a statement out today before the end of today on the announcement section to say, okay, uh, this exam will be for this uh, hour. And for DRC students, it's going to be for this hour. Because they're going to have extended time. But whenever, you know, you can, I'm going to also put it, you can start at any time. But the moment, if you are not ready to start, don't start. The moment you click on start like this, your time is going to be running out. Does that make sense? Okay. And another thing is, let's say I said, okay, I'm just assuming now. If I said this exam is one hour, and maybe one hour, 30 minutes for DROC. I'm just a student. Even though I put the duration to be one hour, 30 minutes, if you are not DROC student, you have to, you must use your one hour. 
Does that make sense? Because uh, passing exams starts from obeying instruction. But I'm going to make sure I put the statement out today. Like, check the announcement section. You're also going to see that. Okay. Make sure you all stay safe and have a lovely day. Bye for now, everyone. Bye. Thank you. You're welcome.